Known for her stunning portraits of people experiencing homelessness, our guest tonight is Leah Denbach. This will be a very interesting conversation about using art and creativity to help those who are more in need. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this episode of Expressions, the podcast. This is episode 21, and we have an amazing guest tonight. I'm very excited uh, to have Leah Denbach on our show today for a big reason. Now, this is going to sound kind of, uh, I don't know if it's going to sound funny, but a long time ago, a few years ago, to me, it's a long time ago, um, my wife's aunt, my aunt, Auntie Lee, told me about you. She said that she met you at a chapters doing a book signing. And she said she was so personable. She was just the most incredible person to talk to. And her photos were so striking. Um, she is who actually first turned me on to your photos. And as a photographer, I was hooked immediately. They're powerful. Uh, they're, they're, I don't want to call them simple, but I, I want to say simple because there's not a lot of stuff. You have a person's face, very clean lighting. And it's not a bunch of um, fluff in a photo that you see a lot of people produce. So I don't want to insult it by saying it's simple. I think that's a positive thing. Um, it's very clean and it's very powerful. And the minute I started looking at the photos, I, I knew where she was coming from when she suggested uh, that I t check out your photos. So after all these times, fast forward a couple of years, here you are. I'm having a conversation with you. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you very much for agreeing to do, to do this with us. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, no problem. I'm, I'm very excited. I'm a little nervous. I'll be honest with you. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> He's been talking um, all week, but I'm nervous. He's like, if I put I in too many show notes here, I'd... <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of research here. Um, but why don't we say hi to Mark and Ryan. Guys, thank you so much for being here this week as well. Uh, Mark, any big news this week? Anything gone on in your world? Uh, not a whole lot. Uh, just uh, more of the same, working working quite a bit, but uh, it comes with the uh, territory. Um, but I know it's been a great week. Um, I had uh, yesterday off, so it was it was nice to relax. We did a bit of exploring uh, around uh, Thunder Bay, and uh, went out on some of the some of the back roads and did some uh, photography and took nice. the dogs for a walk. So it was nice. It was just to get out and, and see stuff. That's my favorite thing to photograph, just going out for drives on back roads and things like that. It's just getting back to nature. Um, Leah, do you do any of that kind of stuff? Do you randomly just go for drives and take pictures too? Um, not in take pictures, but I, I like to go for like drives and stuff. Nice, <laughs> nice. Ryan, man, what have you been up to this week? How have you been? Uh I'm uh, much better than I have been in recent weeks. I know I've been a little uh, a little sparse on the appearances on expressions, but I'm very glad I should be back for the next foreseeable future on every episode. So uh, nice. thank you guys so much for putting up with all the, the fun medical and dental stuff I've had going on. But Pearly Whites are looking great, and we're back, ready to rock and roll. I'm happy to be back on the show. Glad you're back, man. Glad you're back. We've missed you. Yeah, we have. I know. I've missed yeah. you guys. It has been, uh, it's been a weird thing to be going Mondays and sitting at home going, they're recording right now, and I should be there. <laughs> I've done that once. I know what you mean. Yeah. All yeah. right. Enough about us. It's always about us. It should never be about us. <laughs> it's about Leah and the photos and the powerful things that you're doing for people with the work that you do. Um, one of the things that really touches me is that you've donated all the proceeds of your books to charities. Can you kind of go over that with us? First of all, you have three books. And I know you have them there with you. Maybe you can give us a glimpse of, uh, <laughs> of your books there. Yeah, so I um, I have three books, um, volume one, two, and volume three. Um, the series is Nowhere to Go Home, Photographs and Stories of People Experiencing Homelessness. Each book is 40 photographs and 40 stories. Um, the first two volumes are based in North America. Um, the third in a bit of Australia as well as North America. And the fourth that's coming out soon is going to be uh, North America as well. So there's a lot of diversity in there. Um, and then, as Brian mentioned, 100% uh, of the profits of the books um, goes back to different homeless shelters um, that we know really are helping people experiencing homelessness and we work with them personally um so we know that they're doing great work so it's incredible it's a it's a great donation um makes a good gift 
That's mm-hmm. absolutely true. And it helps people, the gift that helps people, right? So, and it's great to hear how involved you are, how hands are hands on you are with that as well. You say that you work with them. Um, you pick the charities personally and you, you are working with that charity specifically. Uh, what makes you choose those charities? How did you find out about them? And uh, how do you know that they're actually doing the good work that they are? So the shelters that we chose to donate the money to are shelters that we specifically were doing shoots at and working with like in multiple locations. So just to give you an example for Nowhere to Call Home Photographs and Stories of the Homeless Volume 1, we fo- donated the money to the Barry Bayside Mission Center. And we did that because Barry, the Barry Bayside Mission Center is the closest place that you could find people experiencing homelessness from where I grew up in Collingwood. So that's where I was often going to take photos of people experiencing homelessness. And just like so happened, um, Chris here on my right shoulder is from the Barry Bayside Mission Center. And um, just because I had done so many shoots there and we had met with the director of the shelter and the people that worked at the shelter and they were just wonderful people. So we, we were like, this is just such a great shelter. So uh, we should definitely donate to this one Um, because there's some, a lot in most cases uh, we hear like negative things about shelters. So when we hear positive things, we, and from a lot of sources and we meet the people and we can see that they're nice people, then we really want to help those shelters out because it's, it's evident that they're really doing the good work and uh, and putting these people first. So. Yeah, that's key. That is definitely key. Have you run into any situations where it, that wasn't the case? You dealt with somebody, uh, a shelter or something that they just didn't want to, they, they didn't seem, you don't have to name names, obviously, but have you ever run into a snag like that where the people just were not receptive? Uh, we haven't actually run into any that weren't receptive. Um, but especially in bigger cities, we've heard like a lot of negative things um, on more general terms. Um, when we say like, oh, why don't you go to a shelter? People say like they don't want to go there because they've been like sexually assaulted or robbed f- from or if they're struggling with addictions and there's people like influencing them in those situations. So they try to avoid them. But a lot of the things um, shelters couldn't have even, even avoid because they don't have the resources. Like in a lot of cases, they're overcapacitated and they don't have the resources to give people like their own space. So if there's someone that's mentally unwell, they might hurt you or steal from you and, and they don't even know they're doing it because it's a mental illness. And And, but we have heard really bad stories, like getting like robbed, like someone used to told us they got the pants like robbed right off their legs as they were sleeping. Um, And then of course being like sexually assaulted, we've heard of, which is just horrible to hear. But um, even if, like I said, the people at the shelter are wonderful people and doing the best that they can, like sometimes these things can occur. It's just that there's not enough money out there to, uh, to give these people like good conditions to stay in. Well, I think that's something that's often overlooked as well is that, you know, I was speaking before we uh, went on air about going to Toronto, seeing these bigger cities. And whenever I go to Toronto, it's generally for, you know, my own amusement, I get to go up, you know, see a show, whatever it is. But then you're constantly reminded of, you know, what you do have when you see those people that are less fortunate. And then hearing these sort of stories, it makes you realize that when you're in these bigger cities, you're right, the shelter lifestyle has got to be extremely volatile at times in these big cities because of the people that could be mentally unwell it's it's an interesting dynamic when you you want to be able to help but also understanding that it's hard to to get to those shelters when again like you said they're they're understaffed or they're under they don't have the exact things that they need to provide for these these people it's it's got to be quite a a battle i would imagine on your end yeah for sure but that's why i think it is really important to to give to the shelters like that's one of the things that I recommend people doing um, in my presentations um, mm-hmm. and in in the work that I do because I think these a lot of the shelters if you're choosing the right ones like I have 
I have uh, lists of the shelters that I know and trust in the back of all of my books. Um, so I think that's a great resource for people. But that's awesome. uh, if, if you're choosing the right ones, I think that these shelters, like they have the know-how and the resources to best help people experiencing homelessness. So that's one of the best ways to help um, on top of like volunteering, and showing them respect and stuff like that. But I think that is a really important thing. Um, when you're having conversations, I know, or when you're making these photographs, Tim is generally, you say he's interviewing your father, is interviewing um, the folks. How much do you actually learn about their lives? Do you find out the history of what brought them to that point in life? Are you finding out uh, their mental health status? Like how are they doing mentally as far as being able to handle the situations that they're in? Um, do you find out if they're able to get the resources that they need? through other ways? Like how much do you actually find out through these interviews uh, in ways that could help them as well? So we often uh, find out quite a bit of information. We have a conversation with the individual and usually in most cases, as soon as we start talking to someone who's experiencing homelessness, they just start telling us about their life, like immediately, like they pour like their whole life out to us and um, everything that a lot, like a lot of the traumatic things that they've gone through. And my dad and I were really shocked at first. Like, why would these people tell us like these really horrible things that happened to them? And like these really, like their whole life story, like when we just met them. But we began to realize since people experiencing homelessness are treated as sort of subhuman in our society and they're neglected and um, avoided by most people. Um, so they've sort of gained this like want of like love and um, like communication and, or even like to have someone see them as like a human. So when, when we look them into the eyes and have a conversation with them, they, it might be like the first time someone has done that in like months because mm -hmm. most people go out of their way to to avoid them and and like they don't treat them very well so they want to tell you they're, they're waiting for somebody they can talk to probably yeah but somebody and, uh, without judgment as well i think that's a big part of that yeah yeah it's not and experiencing judgment when having a conversation sorry for sure and um evidence of that is like this woman catherine just above my head here um we were photographing her in toronto and at the end of speaking with her, she grabbed my dad's hand and with emotion in her voice, she said, thank you so much for doing this. Most people just ignore me. And we've had people say that to us before. And um, so I think that's definitely the reason that um, they, they say so much to us. And we often don't have to ask them that, that many questions. They'll just sort of lead the conversation and tell us about their life, tell us how they ended up being homeless. Um, in some cases, the person is more shy or they're struggling with maybe mental illness or they're tired, for example, so they're less talkative. Uh, and in those cases, we often just ask them questions like, how, how long have you been living in Toronto? How long have you been experiencing homelessness? Do you have any family around? And usually just from a few questions, they'll start leading, leading the conversation in some sort of direction and, and telling us a bit, about, a, a bit about their life. It sounds to me like you've definitely got You've been on an emotional roller coaster, I would feel, given the the career that you're that you're in, just because the stories that you must have to hear and the things that you've you go through on a day to day basis just emotionally must really be hard to deal with at points. Is that something that you've had to overcome? Is it something that you're still trying to deal with? Um, I think, like for me personally, just just the thought of it, I'm thinking I, that's over my head. It's something that I don't know I could do at your level, obviously, because it's it's so hard and heartbreaking to to hear those stories. Yeah, of course. Um, well, um, it is definitely difficult hearing uh, like these horrible stories and and people tell us like about the most horrific things that they've gone through, like being sexually assaulted or 
going through trauma or have like we've had a lot of cases like Chris for Chris for example on my right um, he told us that his small child was hit by a car and because of that his wife commits suicide and we hear a lot of stories like that are really tragic like that and and when we hear them like it really like breaks your heart and and it's horrible to hear and and especially to hear like so many like one after the other and not not really be able to do that much about it um but the only thing i feel like that keeps me going in terms of the work that i do with people experiencing homelessness is just knowing that it is having a positive impact and i, I get a lot of messages from people around the world telling me that after seeing the images, they can't walk by someone experiencing homelessness and not think about their story or volunteer to help at a shelter or even like use their own talents to help people experiencing homelessness. And, and getting those messages um, really keeps me doing the work that I do, even though that it is difficult um, most of the time. So I, I plan to continue doing it as long as as long as I can, for oh, sure. Good for you. Yeah, that really speaks to your character, of course, because again, that's it's got to be tough to deal with that on a day to day, and to be able to keep waking up and saying, "This is what I want to do. This is something that is important to do." It it speaks volumes to your character. So, yeah, and to mention um, my aunt who told me about you in the first place, she said about Catherine, about what she said. You know, it's so nice of you to do this. Most people just ignore me. When she read that, she thought that pretty much sums it up. That actually made her cry. And I would imagine as an artist, that's pretty much what you're going for. You wanna try and give people the emotion that they need to have to care about a situation. And I would say that that would have been a successful photo and a successful moment as an artist to have somebody like my aunt view your photo and really appreciate what it is that you're trying to tell, what story it is you're trying to convey. So, you know, I, when she told me that, that was out of the blue, a quote that she mentioned to me, um, I'm thinking as a photographer, that is the most successful thing that I could do or you could do as a photographer is to have people feel that, like genuinely feel that. I shoot professional wrestling. Like I can take a picture of a wrestler punching another guy in the face and that could be an emotion getter, but none of these things could actually bring tears to people's eyes, like an image and a story that you share. So I love that. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, definitely the, the emotion is, is high when you're looking at these images. I mean, uh, first off, uh, kudos on the images. I mean, you're, you're, uh, I, I encourage anybody to go to your, <laughs> go to your website and see these images buy the books, um, because these images are very, very striking. Um, they're, they're very, um, they just the, the image itself. Each one of them tells its own story. And then uh, on your website, which is uh, uh, humanizingthehomeless.org, uh, on uh, on Leah's website. So if you go there and see these images of these people uh, coupled with the stories, and it's amazing, as you were saying, just how thankful these people are to to just talk to somebody. But some of the things I saw, one of the stories were. Um, she was holding up a broken mask during COVID and your, and your dad had a spare one and he gave her a spare mask and she was very thankful for that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a lot of things that we take for granted, I think, as uh, Canadians living in Canada and, and having the things that we have um, and the excess of things that we have, you know, um, something as simple as a spare face mask was a big thing for one of these people just so that they could feel safe. For sure. Yeah, most people um, during the pandemic, they, they didn't think about how COVID-19 was affecting people experiencing homelessness because it affected people who had a home badly, but then if you had no home, like you, it, like one woman experiencing homelessness even said, like it made her life absolutely unbearable. It was already hard, but it was absolutely unbearable at that point because people wouldn't wouldn't give out money or they is this still the case they won't give out money anymore because of social distancing um they no longer even want to go around people experiencing homelessness the little bit that they would um the the places that were open 
Uh, this is a little bit less now that things are opening up, but the places that are open, in most of the cases, wouldn't let um, anybody into the washrooms. So they had no place to go to the washroom, no place to wash their hands, no place to clean themselves in any way. So a lot of people experiencing homelessness told us they had to really like, resort to like using the washroom in an alleyway. And like, that was like so unhumane. And like a lot of women said like that was horrible for them to have to go through because there's like no washrooms available. And um, as well, a lot of the people experiencing homelessness that were getting help with their addictions, uh, like through counseling and programs, all those programs shut down when COVID started. So a lot of the people experiencing homelessness that had been making their way out of recovery and making progress in their life and stuff like that, all of a sudden lost all that. So they had to go back to starting from scratch um, without any resources. And so the, there's so many things. Um, That's extremely eye-opening. Just That people knowing, never like, even thought about, yeah. Yeah, like the entire pandemic, as you had mentioned, it, it rocked all of our worlds that we had thought, oh, it's it was crazy enough for us to try to adjust to our own way of living. But hearing this, it again, just puts into perspective it's it's degrading that they have to go through this because as you mentioned earlier these are people these are human beings and they should in no way be subjected to to that sort of treatment and again as the pandemic messed up a lot of different things that's one thing it should not have messed up and it's it's just that's it's heartbreaking to hear that it, it genuinely is heartbreaking to hear that it's the people that have the least that get hurt the most most often yeah and it's the fact that we were were ignorant to it as a uh, society because i i guarantee if i talk to you know my friends or the people around me no one else had thought of that either i certainly will be the first to admit it as you mentioned that i my world's kind of like oh i completely never considered that i never would have thought that as a as a possibility so it's it's very eye opening um, yeah it was it was the same for me like i hadn't really thought about it until um, I read an article about how the homeless were affected and then my dad and I were like, this is so much worse than we ever thought. Like, we really need to get out on the streets and start getting the stories of of how hard it is for these people because we mm -hmm. realized how important that really was. So you've been back out on the streets, so to speak, talking to people since COVID hit and finding out their stories dealing with COVID as well? Yeah, we took a small break um, when COVID first hit um because everyone was like really worried of course we didn't know um and my dad like is more concerned because he works um he works in like a group home with people that are mentally disabled mm. uh so he was more concerned like if he was to get covid he can't like do his job and it could affect the people that he works with in the group home so he wanted to be more careful but um so for a few months we weren't going, but after reading that article about how hard it was for these people, um, we decided like we'll just take extra precautions, um, be a be really careful, and but we really need to go out and and take these photographs. So so those photographs that you saw of the woman with the broken mask and and uh, if you go on my Instagram humanizing underscore the underscore homeless. Um, that's where I have all my most recent work. And you can see like probably like a hundred photos of people experiencing homelessness throughout the pandemic. Hmm. Um, I've been like going out um, several times um, to Toronto, a few other cities, but I just went to Los Angeles uh, and a bit of California as well and got some stories there. So um, I think those are really important to read. Um, and a lot of the people experiencing homelessness don't even mention the pandemic because they don't really even realize what's going on most of the time without having access to the news um, or any resources that tells them what's going on. And in a lot of cases, if they're mentally unwell, um, they won't they won't even know that we're in a pandemic. Um, <clears throat> so even though there's stories that are from the pandemic in some cases they won't they won't mention it at all hmm. even if we ask because they okay. are or if we ask they, they don't even know what we're talking about uh, we can't seem to do a show without talking about it almost all the time so <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> yeah. about it. it's, it's still it's just so eye-opening very yeah. eye-opening absolutely absolutely you don't know what i'm kind of 
I'm also kind of curious because as you you're mentioning there, uh, just speaking with all these people and obviously donating will always help. Is there certain things that as a society we can avoid doing that would also help? Because as we you mentioned, these are people at the end of the day. And I think there's a lot of judgment that gets thrown around. There's a lot of hate that gets thrown around. What as society can we do, at least the good ones, the good people out there, can we be doing that we may not be aware that we're doing or stop doing that we may not be aware that we're doing to encourage those judgments or because to me, like there's certain times where I feel like I've done something now to, you know, maybe cast judgment without realizing it, whether it be the way that I talk, maybe a, a phrase that I use. There's certain things that we should be changing or dialogue that we should be having. So um, because my mother was homeless and, and rescued by Mother Teresa, I take a lot of Mother Teresa's quotes on as like a model for the work that I do with people experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. And one of her quotes is, if you don't know them, don't judge them. And that's a big quote um, in, that I've taken as the motto that kind of encompasses my, my project because I really struggled with that at, at first as well. Like when I, my dad first recommended, like, why don't we go take photos of people experiencing homelessness? I was like, I don't know, like, um, I had only ever heard negative things, so I was like, I don't think that's a good idea. But um, and plus, you were what, twelve? I was fifteen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was pretty young, and um, but gradually he talked me into it, and it changed my whole perspective because I realized that none of those stereotypes were, almost none of them were true, and that they're most often very kind and humble people. So. Um, I think like a big thing that's important for all of us to do is is to follow that quote by Mother Teresa that if you if you don't know the person, why why would we judge them? Because why would we even think it's our right to judge this person? Like when we have no idea how they ended up homeless, we have no idea their life story, mm -hmm. and like if we actually took the time to listen to it, I think in almost every case, you'd be shocked. And yeah, well, you're living proof of that at this stage, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and I think, take my word for it, like, um, every time like I hear their story, it's like, never what I expected. Like, just to give you one example, like, there was this one guy, Dexter, who was under the Gardner Expressway in Toronto, and, and he looked like a really tough guy, and he was, like, shaped head, and tattoos, and scars, and my dad and I were like, oh, like, should we, should we approach him? Like, we're all alone under the Garden Expressway. Like, if anything goes wrong, like, no one could hear us. And we're like, right. okay, like, we have to do it anyway. And so we went up and introduced ourselves to this guy. And he ended up being, like, one of the sweetest people I've met in my entire life. Um, but, in fact, he lost his wife and son to a drunk driver. And he's blamed it himself for it ever since he's never been able to recover emotionally and he was a war veteran um and was taken hostage and tortured so that's why he was covered in in scars so due to the just traumatic experiences that he's been through he hasn't been able to live in a house he just lives under the gardener expressway and he told us like he bikes to i think it was a, like a different province that was on the other side of Canada every summer. And that's why he's like so fit. And that's it was just incredible. like, just blew my mind. And like, it's stories like that, that really, I think, change people's perception of homelessness. Because when you first see the person, if it wasn't for the story, you still have like time to judge them and think like, oh, they're probably just a drug addict or they chose to be there or they're dangerous. but when you actually hear their story and you see like, no, their wife and son was killed by a drunk driver. And you realize like, if that happened to me, I wouldn't be able to recover either. Like I would be under a bridge if I had no friends and no family to take me in and, and support me emotionally. Like, I think I would be honestly like under a bridge too, like if I didn't have those support systems. So, so I think that that is really yeah. important for people to see for sure. Just trying to bring up a photo of Dexter here. So there is, yeah, yeah that's see. Dexter. <laughs> I, I noticed in uh, a lot of the stories. But yeah, no, and that, uh, again, you're living proof of that. Oh. Sorry, is there a lag there? 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm a little mm -hmm. bit behind here, so I think there's going to be a oh, delay. I kind of okay. froze okay. for a second. <laughs> so I was I was just saying I noticed in a lot no, of the stories ahead. you ask people if they had uh, family. Um, you know, so some of them said they came from the Peterborough area, for example, and did they have family? And and at least one of them said that she had a, an older daughter as well, but hadn't had any contact with them. Um, do you run into that situation a lot where people? they have family and they have friends, but they just have no contact for whatever reason it is? We do run into that a lot. Um, but it, it seems to be that the, the family was often like not, not good people or are very unkind and they kind of pushed that person out um, or were abusive. Um, just to give you one example, there was a woman named Diamond that we were photographing. And she told us that although her parents still live close by, um, she doesn't have any contact with them because her father stole from her her whole life and her mother was a drug addict. So, okay. and she said, even though she has like several step sisters and brothers, none of them want to see her and they all, have chosen not to have contact with her. So she, she said she's absolutely alone. Uh, and just in, in her case specifically, um, her fiance had just died um, after on his way to recovery. So she was, when we were taking her photograph, she was in tears almost the whole time. Like she was in, in such a, a bad emotional state. Um, so we definitely meet a lot of people um that have family but they're just not they're not there for them um and of course if if they were there for them then this person wouldn't be on the street like that's what doesn't make any sense to me like if that was like my mother or my brother or something i would be there like today and like put them in my car so, really makes you wonder really really so makes yeah i think there's definitely like something wrong in a lot of those family dynamics or this person isn't mentally well and like for example their children aren't equipped to handle that so in some cases it's not their choice um because we've actually gotten a surprising amount of messages from family and friends of individuals that see the image and they say like this is my mother or this is my my sister like Thank you so much for for mm. taking the time to photograph them and and be kind to them. Like, do you know where they are? And and a lot of really sad ones are. Um, we get a lot of messages from from children that are saying like, "This this is my mother, and and oh, I don't wow. know where she is." Like, I I last time I saw her, like I was this this much like years old. Do you have any other photographs of her? And like do you know where I could find her and stuff like that? That is so powerful. That is such a powerful yeah. thing. Your photos are, are potentially connecting people, at least giving some people closure or understanding at a different level, even of their own family members. And that is powerful. Crazy. For sure. It's, you, it's um, very eye opening. Like I've been saying, I, uh, again, I'm just, I'm in, I'm in shock personally. And that's something I do enjoy about this show is some of the guests that we've had on have really opened up my eyes. And I think a lot of the eyes of our listeners to the actual world around us, things that we were ignorant to before. So I really want to thank you for that. Cause again, it's, it's never, uh, never a dull moment here in expressions where all of a sudden I'm, we're walking away with just something that really, it hits home. It hits home it in resonates. ways that we never thought it would. Yeah. Do you keep in touch with the families or the people that you've talked to? Do you follow up, do a, a shoot down the road or check in to see how they're doing do you keep is there a way to keep in touch even um i keep in touch like in terms of like a lot of them some message me on instagram and stuff like that so like I, I keep them in my messages so that if i ever do find that person again or have any more information then i can easily send it to them and like find the messages um but other than that, I, I usually don't because usually the person messages and they ask, like, do you know where they are or something like that? And, and after that, uh, I don't think they really want to talk necessarily. Fair enough, um, yeah. They kind of just want to know, do you, do you know where they are? And, and when I say no, but I'll, I'll let you know like if I, if I see them or have any feedback. And then um, there are some cases that we do try to keep in contact. Um, if the individual wants to, like just 
to give you one example, there's this individual named Steven who was homeless in Collingwood where I grew up and I had become friends with him and was like, would give him a ride in my car because he was in a wheelchair and he couldn't get around very well. And, and then one time, like he got beat up and killed on the street. Um, and his mother was really upset about it. So we were able to keep in contact with his mother. And like to this day, we've been talking with her and like letting her know um, like how we've been doing. And she lets us know how she's been doing and stuff like that. But um, so there's some cases that people want to stay in contact with us. But um, in most of the time, um, they, yeah, they just kind of want to know where they are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have you have you had any um, people that you've interacted with, possibly somebody that's in one of your books that has contacted you later on after the shoot and, and after the book is out uh, to let you know that they're doing better and that they've found a permanent residence and, and potentially um, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I think some people that are experiencing homelessness do hold jobs as well, but uh, probably many of them don't. Are, are you finding that anybody is reaching out and saying, Hey, you know, thanks for thanks for the talk. Thank you for noticing me and, and making me feel like I was a valued member of society. I'm doing much better now. Um, do you ever have that sort of thing? Uh, I do, but it is rare. Um, it's really hard to keep in contact with the people experiencing homelessness because in most cases when we meet them, they don't have a fixed address, of course. They don't have a phone number. Uh, they don't have a cell phone. Like so they really have no way of keeping in contact. Right. Um, but if there's some individuals who, who have some, some sort of contact information and they have been able to reach out to me and just to give you one example, um, this woman named Lucy, who that's in the cover of my first book, um, we've been able to keep, keep in contact with her like to this day um, and kind of keep a good relationship with her um and her story is actually like really amazing um and ha has had a big impact on me uh when we first took her photograph she, she was in really bad condition she was struggling with opioids uh she said she had been struggling with that ever since she was 14 years old um and that she really seemed in poor health um but gradually after the time of of running into her she was able to get housing and and work on her addictions and um, her and her boyfriend Riley, who I also photographed, uh, are now housed and, and living in Toronto. And um, I received an email from Riley, her boyfriend, that really like changed my, my view and made me realize how important my work was. Uh, he said that me choosing to put Lucy's photograph on the cover of my book um, made Lucy feel human. And he attributes that to the reason that they're alive today. He said that when I took the photograph of the two of them, they had both given up on life and, and they were struggling with addiction. And he said now, um, because of the fact that Lucy was on the cover of the book, they have been able to be housed um, they've been able to work on their addiction. He said that Lucy's now a healthy weight and happier than he's ever seen her and that they're both well on their way and being uh, happy in both mind, body, and soul. And that nice. was like, the awesome. best email that I ever could have gotten. And, and awesome. hearing from someone experiencing homelessness, recognizing them is so important to me because but that's one of my goals with my book is to humanize people experiencing homelessness. And I, I usually only hear it from the audience, but to hear it from like the subjects themselves was, was really important. So, so there are some happy cases out there, but it, it is rare. And sadly, in most cases, we often hear actually not that they got housed, but that they passed away. In most cases, we hear that for some reason um, they were killed on the streets uh like the steven individual i just mentioned yeah i, th I think for 
society as a whole. I mean, I don't think you can go anywhere and and not see somebody uh, or, or several somebodies that are experiencing homelessness. Um, here, I, I live in Thunder Bay, and every day when it, when I leave my house and when I'm coming home, there are certain uh, intersections where they 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 are with signs. Most of them are looking for money or food. Um, they're uh, you know oft, often they get. Um, you know, sort of ignored when when you see people at the stoplights, they just sit there and they stare straight ahead and they don't acknowledge those people. And and I think we've all probably been guilty, myself included, been guilty of that. Um, one of the things that I like to do is because I travel for work quite often, I have food in my car. I've got um, like non-perishable things like uh, beef jerky or or whatever in my car. And often, if I see see somebody and I'm stopped at light, I will hand out that that bag of beef jerky or, or uh, nuts or whatever it is I have um, for them. And they, they off, often uh, will take it with a big smile. Sometimes they'll just take it not say anyone. Anyway. <clears throat> often they do say thank you. Um, if, if people are looking to help um, people experiencing homelessness, uh, would you recommend that a donation of, of food or money would be uh, just as helpful or would one be preferred over the other? Um, sorry, I don't, don't fully understand what you mean. So if, if somebody wants to, to help out, uh, somebody that's experiencing homelessness, uh, in their own community, um, often I see that they're holding signs that say, you know, anything helps. Would you recommend that we, uh, as a society, would it be better to give those people food or would it be better to give them some money so that they could, uh, potentially use it to buy other things that they needed? Um... I think it, of course, depends on whatever we're with or whatever is like someone has the most resources of. But I think it kind of goes back to what I was um, answering before to Ryan's question of of the Mother Teresa's quote and if you don't know them, don't judge. And if you have, if you really have that mentality of not judging them, then why why would we think not give them money because like it's it's the people that are making the stereotypes that think like we can't give them money because they're all going to spend it on drugs and like and i think in almost every case that's not true like these people are struggling to survive they need food they need water if they're women they need feminine hygiene drugs maybe they need clothes maybe they need band-aids so I think if you're able to, the most important thing is to give them money. And then they have that one more resource so that, yeah, maybe they are hungry, but maybe what they really need is like some disinfectant because they just like cut their hand open. Okay. So like if you give them money, then they're able to go get that. And me personally, I always give people experiencing homelessness money when I, when I see them, if I have the money to give. and. and and in almost every case, they say back to me, like, thank you so much. I'm going to go use this for something. And I, I'm shocked. I'm always like, what? You're going to go get, like, nail clippers or polysporin or, like, a permanent marker or, like, a hairbrush. And I'm like, I didn't think that hmm. that's what they were well, going to That's like, a huge point, so, too, because like, I know that yeah. you're somewhat younger. Oh, I'm still behind, aren't I? <laughs> I can tell at the point that I'm cutting people off here. <laughs> Um, but that's a big point because I know that you're that you're younger and you're informing so many people of any age. That's something that that's really eye opening to me as well. Is that you you have such this vast knowledge of of what's going on and anybody from myself to Brian to to I mean anybody who isn't aware of this, you're able to inform them. And it's I think the biggest thing to to add on to Mark's point there is is to really get to know the, these people is if you have the time spend the time to actually get to know them and then you can know exactly what it is that they do need like give the money when you have it and then if you develop that relationship with them over time if it's somebody in your own community then you can be able to you'll see them once you'll see them when you can and be able to give them the things that that they do need so i think that's a, a huge thing is building those relationships um, especially in a town like mine i'm in a small town where there isn't a, a huge 
problem with with people experiencing homelessness we don't have a lot of people in that situation to my knowledge but the few people that i have seen around if i take the time and the others in our community take the time to get to know them the difference it could have is would be astronomical just and i can tell just from talking with you that that would be proof is just take the time to get to know them and and it would just do wonders yeah i i should have mentioned that for sure like i think the most important thing is to not just give them money but to have the conversation conversation yeah as well so then what i'll do when i give someone money or um is talk to them and just to give you one example i, I was speaking with someone and i said like do you need some money and he said to me like no I, I actually don't need any money but i really need a marker to make a sign and i was like could you go grab me a marker somehow and i was like oh of course like that's like no problem for me so like i just went over grabbed like a bunch of markers and like some water and and some stuff like that because i was like are you sure you don't need water and food and he's like no i really need like a marker it's really important so i was like okay so like if, the, if that's what the person really needs but they have no way of getting it like you're not going to realize until you have that conversation with them or this other woman that um i was or sorry, this other gentleman that I was speaking to, um, when I was having a conversation with him, I asked him like, why, why don't you stay at a shelter? And he was one of the rare cases where he said like, oh, I don't know where any shelters are. Like, I'd love to stay at a shelter, but I have no way of finding a shelter. And I said to him like, oh, like I know some shelters. So like I went on my cell phone, which he doesn't have access to the internet, looked up the closest shelter, like, Put, we put him in my car and drove him. I found, I called them. I was like, okay, like, can you take someone? They said, yeah, if, like, you bring them before this time. So I was like, okay. So I, like, drove him over there. And, like, that's just the most simple thing. Like, it took me 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, but this guy said to me he couldn't walk because he had a splint and, and the bone was, like, broken. And because of that, uh, and he was probably new to the area, he had no way of finding a shelter and unless someone like me like took that like just a few minutes to speak to him and say what do you need we would never know like he needed a meal and he needed to be taken to a shelter and most people like would never stop and think they just would like avoid them or, or something like that so i think having that conversation is the most important thing and and most people also don't think about that that's really going to change their life like to have a conversation with them is the most important thing you could do because like people experiencing homelessness have said to me like yeah like, throw money at me but they won't even make eye contact and they like won't stop and, and like say a word to me they throw money and like that's what makes me think like even if people give, they often like still don't treat them as a human. So like treating them mm -hmm. as a human being is really the most important thing. And it's really what they're most craving is, is also treating them with, with love. So I think if you're going to give them money, though, and if you have like a little bit of time, the most important thing could be to like say, hey, do you want to like get a, like some food with me? Like I'll take you out for lunch. And then you can have some lunch. You can have a great conversation. You can see that that person's happily fed. Um, and then during that conversation, you can find out, oh, oh, what else do they need? Like maybe they need an extra pair of underwear. Maybe they need some deodorant or something. And that's like more personal things you would only find out if you if you take the time to sit down with them. So if you're already going to grab a bite to eat, why not? invite someone experiencing homelessness to, to join you and and it would like change their life so i think and it's so simple that's really so important. simple like you said yeah now as a young girl doing this it probably wasn't the safest thing for you to do this on your own so we've talked about how your family has helped your father has been a big part of uh what you've been doing and talking to people and helping you along the way maybe your father wants to pay us a little visit and say hi is he nearby? By any <laughs> yeah, chance? I can. He uh, he definitely wanted to join. I just don't know how we let him know. Like maybe we, I can call him on the phone or. Oh, is he or, not uh, with you there? No, I uh, I live on my own. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Cool. Well, I could message him. 
I'll give him a call. But uh, <laughs> I think he has the link. So if if I gave him a call or or if he if we emailed him, he'd probably. See yeah, I'll send him a quick email. One of the things though that I was um, I was thinking, and maybe I'm being a little real here, um, but. I think everybody's always trying to search for a reason or trying to search for um, something that makes you different from somebody who is experiencing homelessness. If like Mark said, every time I drive into Barry, there's a off ramp. And as you're coming into Barry, there are usually some people there with signs. They walk up and down the lane. And like Mark says, you try and avoid contact or eye contact and it's, you don't feel good about it. I mean, obviously you want to help every single person you can help. But at the same time, my brain is kind of going and it's, it is wired to make assumptions like what happened to this person to bring him to this point um, or her? Uh, what what could I have done that possibly could have landed me there? Like how different are we? I don't think there's that much of a difference between most people. And it's really easy. and It's just one bad decision away from almost everybody that they can end up in that situation. So as much as, you know, um, you don't want to make assumptions and you don't want to assume anything at the same time. It's really hard to, to see the people experiencing homelessness and not just think either one of two things, either thank God I am in the position that I'm in, or I've made the decisions that I've made, or I'm, I've had the support that I've had, or, you know, how can I help in a real way for this person? And I know the conversation is important, but you're not going to get that when you're parked at a parking lot or parking a red light. You're not going to have an opportunity to have a conversation. Is there's cars behind you and cars in front of you, and you can't just pull over. So, just I don't know. It, it's a hard thing to answer, and it's a hard thing to even think, to be honest, because, like I say, we all want to help as many people as we can, but there are those situations where you just you can't, and you don't know what to do about it, and you feel guilty about it. And it's, it's a hard situation for everybody. Um, I don't even know if there's a question there or if it's more just kind of a statement, but uh, I think it's a realization. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe just a realization. Maybe just like an aha, uh -huh, like oh, this yeah. really sucks that I can't do more. You know, like it, it's frustrating. It is very I, frustrating to see people going through this. I did just want to add to your point. Um, when you were speaking, you did say at one point, uh, what could they have possibly done wrong to get in that situation? And I'm thinking that's still the mindset yeah. of of blaming them and judging. This is my point them. exactly. I think, um, and, and I'm just being and real with that's the thing, right? Avoid, yeah. It's, because um, in most cases, they didn't do anything wrong. They were just living their life, and and they something happened, and then they didn't have. The support system to keep them out of the chain. And just to give you one story as an example, I was photographing this woman named Kimberly in Australia, and she told me she was living a happy life with her seven kids and her husband. And one of her kids accidentally set fire to the house, and her whole house burnt down. Lost all seven kids to child safety, and Oof. now she's been homeless for the past several years, trying to get her children back and trying to get a job, and like stories like that and some of the ones i've given before are just evidence like people like this didn't do anything wrong yeah yeah it just life that's, happens that's extremely so disheartening some, some people need to look have an open mind and not have any judgment and and do what mother Teresa said and, and if we don't know them don't judge them so i think in those situations where where we draw someone like, if we don't have time to say anything at the very least like smile like say smile like wave like say hey how are you like something like that and then so it's not at the very least it's not someone that's like avoiding eye contact or driving away at the very least they see someone giving them a smile and i think that's like an important thing on its own so if that's all you have time to do because i i also find that's really hard like when you see someone at an intersection because you only have like two seconds and that's sometimes i'm like oh i want to give them money but the light just changed and so then in those cases i just do my best to try to make eye contact give them a smile um say sorry and then they like, kind of drive away that's at the very least that changes human interaction every other yeah. person is is gonna 
say something mean to them or avoid eye contact or something. So. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's exactly, I think what I was trying to, uh, to learn and I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. And, and I think for myself, like I'm, I'm sitting here feeling like the biggest a-hole in the world right now, because just last week I was sitting in a parking lot. I was on a conference call and I was listening and a fellow walked up to my car and I did exactly what everybody else does. I just stared forward and I waited for him to leave. And I'm thinking to my, now I'm thinking if that happens again, I'm going to acknowledge that person. I need to change my mindset. I need to change the way I look at people experiencing homelessness because really to your point, I am one bad decision or one bad event away from losing everything myself. Um, you know, it, it could happen. Um, and I mean, we have protections that put us, you know, uh, hopefully um, that things that will protect us like insurance and things like that, but it doesn't always work. And sometimes one bad life event happens and everything's gone. And um, yeah, well, life is, is very I, circumstantial. I, to, I think that's yeah. a huge thing. Yeah, I have to change my mindset and um, it's going to take work and I know it's going to take work, but I, I'm here to tell you it's work I'm willing to put in because you're, you're hundred percent correct. They are all human beings at the end of the day, whether they're male or female or, or, you know, whether they're any other uh, orientation at all, it, it doesn't matter. They're a human being at the end of the day and we need to treat them like they're human beings. So uh, I am going to do my damnedest to change my mindset. And I, I think you've definitely, you've, you've kicked me in the ass <laughs> and uh, my mindset is already <laughs> changing. So thank you. Thank you so much for helping me to see more. Yeah. And that's another Thank reason you. I wanted I you that. as our guest, yeah. because I know the story you're, you're telling is something that people need to hear, whether they're ready to, or they realize they're ready to or not. So yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we are going to move on unless there was anything else you'd like to talk about. Um, actually, you know, one thing I do want to talk about is when your book is coming out at the volume four, which you, I believe is in October, right? October, uh, it might be delayed, but that's what we're hoping for. Okay. Okay. And where will people be able to find that through your website or other means? Um, so I guess if people would like um, to be contacted about it, the best way is so if you sign up for that, you'll get an email um, when the book comes out saying like, hey, the book's out and like we'll be doing a book signing uh, to introduce it or something. So that would be like the best option um but if you're also following me on social media um humanizing the homeless on instagram uh humanizing the homeless on on facebook um that would also be a great way because i'm sure i'll, I'll be posting about um things but just so you don't miss it um the best thing would probably be signing up for that uh, email list on my website perfect well i definitely uh, recommend which was people to do that. uh humanist.org <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat that? I think I was talking over you. It was humanizingthehomeless.org is the website. Thank you. Perfect. And of course, we'll have links available in both of our Instagram, Facebook posts. So if you're listening to this on Spotify right now and you're following us, go and check it out. And we'll have links posted all across social media for that. Absolutely. Okay. So now we have three questions that we ask every guest at the end of an episode. The first question I've already sent to you and you've answered. The other two questions you have no clue about. Uh, <laughs> they're not hard. Don't worry. <laughs> I saw a little bit of panic there. Just a, just a slight little bit of panic there. <laughs> um, the question that you know about is our challenge that we ask our guests to issue to our listeners. So you had a great challenge and I don't know if you remember it word for word, but, uh, maybe I'll just hand it over to you and you can explain the challenge that you have for our listeners this week. For sure. Um, so actually in several of my talks, I, I challenge my listeners um, concerning people experiencing homelessness. And it's just what I mentioned earlier. If you don't know them, don't judge them. So think about it in this way. If you don't know these people and their stories and you don't know what they've been th through, we shouldn't think we have the right to judge them. And that is often what we do. Often we look at them and think that they're lazy or that they've chosen to be on the street. But I think it is best that if we follow this advice, 
uh, because we don't know the person's situation. And if we judge people, we have no time to love them. And that is another quote from Mother Teresa. So my challenge to the listeners would be, don't prejudge any people experiencing homelessness. They're often some of the most kind and humble people I've ever met. So if you have the time, stop and, and chat with them instead and show them compassion. Um, Cause you'd really, really surprised how much even these small gestures are appreciated. Excellent. Good challenge and something everybody can do. And I, I'm going to do it myself for sure. Definitely. It's one of the few challenges I'm genuinely going to commit to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So now for the other two questions. Now, uh, by the way, I did send a, a message to Tim, an email. I would love for him to show up. If he doesn't show up by the end of our conversation, I apologize. Uh, I'm very thankful for the, for the help he's given us as a show to have you on and for all the work he's done for you uh, over your lifetime and how he's encouraged you in all the ways that he has. I think um, having parents that encourage their kids is key. I sell cameras for a living. And when I have a customer come in with their kid and they're ready to buy their kid a camera to get them into photography, I am just like over the moon excited because here's a child. I didn't necessarily get all the encouragement that I would have liked to have had as a kid. Uh, my mother bought me a drum set, which was awesome. And I still play the drums. So there's, there's encouragement, but to have somebody go all in and, you know, take you to the city and take care of you and help you with the interviews. I have a lot of respect for Tim. I think that was uh, a really great job he did bringing you up and it's obvious in, in how caring and passionate you are about what you do. So kudos to him. Got to give him a lot of credit. And um, now on to the next questions. So this is a fun one. Uh, what's your jam? What song do you listen to? that absolutely gets you going every time you can't skip past it. You, every time you hear this song, it's just, you love it. Is there a song like that? Are you big into music or, or is there just nothing? Um, <laughs> this question gives me anxiety because <laughs> oh, no, I don't want to give you anxiety. <laughs> I'm not like a music person. And I like, I really like listening to music, but I like, don't know like artists and like songs. That's fine. Um, What's your vibe? But like, Are you into I, heavier music? Just the song or? that comes to mind is um, like my partner and I have a song. It's like the song Blinding Lights. It's just like we heard it when we like um, we both really like the song. So when I think about that song, it like makes me really happy and like nice. that's what I am. So like that's one one song, I guess, that like is my jam, I guess. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I ask all the people, yeah. what's your jam? Some people have no clue what I'm talking about. I'm old. I, I It's like a saying. <laughs> <you know? laughs> well, thank you. That's perfect. That's perfect. Um, and the last question of the night for you is uh, tools of the trade. Uh, a tool of the trade could be anything. It could be a literal tool that you use to make your daily job better. Or it could just be an idea and a concept that you follow and something that guides you to just doing better at what you do every day. Do you feel that you've got a tool of the trade that you fall back on all the time? So when you say tool without usually something you actually use as a tool? It doesn't have to be. Mark's tool of the trade is his creativity, thinking outside the box. My tool of the trade was my leather man, which is literally a tool. So it could be like something that when you're out shooting uh, that you have with you, it could be just a mindset that you have that gets you through the day. More anxiety. I don't know. If this is, <laughs> is this, so I would almost like say ruining empathy. it, but <laughs> no, no. I would say empathy if it was if it was me, because just from hearing the stories and hearing the work that you put in, it's yeah. you, you're one of the most empathetic people that I've ever had a chance to speak with. The it takes a lot of dedication, a lot of mental energy to to do what you do. And I think to, to have that empathy is, is very key in what you do. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's something I don't often admit, but that's that's probably one of my best traits. 100% it would be, tool, yeah. Tools of the trade, I guess, if we're going to put it like that. <laughs> It, it is, it's really good. I mean, if you can be empathetic and care enough to stop and talk to somebody who really needs to talk, where most people don't, that's a solid tool right there. Excellent. 
<laughs> All right. Mark, Ryan, any other questions you'd like to ask? I'm, I'm, I have one other question I'm going to ask, but I'm going to ask if you guys have any questions that you want to ask first. I do have one question, and it, uh, it actually relates back to your father as well, because you had mentioned that he was working uh, along people with mental disabilities. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So has he been involved in humanitarian work throughout most of his life? And that's kind of where you've adopted that same mentality and been able to, to follow in his footsteps? Because it just it sounds to me like you've been very encouraged by the the life that he had lived, or at least the, the things that he's trying to pass on to you, and you've taken it in stride. Um, so my parents have always been involved with like, um, volunteering and in the community and stuff like that. So that's always been like a big thing throughout my life. Like, um, every year for Christmas, for example, we would, um, serve the unfortunate people in our community and like, like that kind of thing. Um, so like, that's always been something, but, um, when we decided to take on Project of people experiencing homeless students, and um, in toward, sort of to back that up, both my parents are actually artists as well. Um, so that's a, been a big reason that they love my work and have been so supportive. And and Brian, like just adding to what you had mentioned before, in terms of like encouraging your children and how is um, my dad had mentioned to me that like he he was really passionate about art and he's actually like one of the most talented painters like I've seen in my entire life. Like his painting nice. is amazing. Like he's a hyper realist painter. So like you would never be able to look at him. So he told me like he never really got support for his work and, and his parents didn't encourage him or support him at all. So because of that, he's tried to go out of his way and, and be extra supportive, especially with this project um photographing people experiencing homelessness um so i think i think that's really uh really awesome and and it's been in really important and, and really the reason that i'm doing the project because uh, it was yeah a big motivator me. yeah yeah it was him who encouraged me and so even though the project started out for artistic reasons like i mentioned earlier like after the first experience we really, really had our, our mission and, and took it on sort of as a project. Um, so at that time we weren't really doing like humanitarian work and and it kind of ended up coming about like doing portraits. And then after that experience, we were like, okay, like this is way worse than we thought. Like we should also mm -hmm. be showing people how bad this is and and stuff like that so the humanitarian aspect kind of emerged out of um the artistic aspect i guess that's incredible that's incredible mark anything you'd like to add i uh, just want to say th thank you so much for being here uh to speak with us and and to talk about your your books and the work that you're doing and uh obviously talking about uh, the big issue, which is people are ex experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, I just encourage everyone to go uh, check out your social media feeds, uh, the website, hum humanizingthehomeless.org, uh, and please help out when you can. And uh, to Leah's point, you know, if you don't know them, don't judge them. And uh, I just, uh, I want to, that's going to be my new mantra <laughs> going forward. So uh, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate uh, your talking to us today. Absolutely. And my last Thank question you. is, what kind of camera do you use? Just a full 180. <laughs> it's a, it's a, the most important question. No, it's not at all. But what kind of camera? What's, what's your camera of choice? Um, so my camera choice has been like a big evolution. Um, when I first started the project, I was 15, and I saved up my money and bought myself a camera from like a used store, and it was like a T2i, and then I was able to upgrade to a T5i. <laughs> and then, um, well, this is when, like, I had, like, no resources to get myself a camera, so. And uh, then I was lucky, like, one of my fans gave me a camera. They gave me a 5D Mark II. Oh, so that was the first sweet. time I had, like, a decent camera. And when I had a 5D Mark II, I also got a 24 to 70 millimeter 
so I had like a nice lens on there. Uh, and I've been using that until I went to school in 2018. And then I was using um, the 5D, I think it is, or 6D, like one of the newer Canon models, like it's a bit newer than the one I have, but I can only use that during the school year. But then just recently I got a new camera. So I got um, the S Sony A7R, a mirrorless camera. So that's been really exciting. So you've moved and that's really like, nice. yeah, it's really changed my work. Um, Cause it's like this, this camera is amazing, like with the eye tracking and, mm -hmm. and the focus. And um, so it's been really nice because before that I was using the 5D Mark II still and like it is like 10 years old. So like, yeah. it's, been, it's been pretty yeah, tough. Terrible, terrible camera. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> Ryan's like, I have no clue what cameras he's using. Way over my head, right? Just throw out a bunch of letters and numbers and Ryan's like, yeah, I don't know. My brain is like, yes, this is making perfect sense. This is yeah. this is excellent. <laughs> I don't know anything about cameras either. Like, this is just the one thing. So the biggest thing is like, I switched to like a really nice mirrorless camera. So like, it's the first time in my life, like I've actually had like um, an industry standard, like really good camera. Good for you. So I think that's, that's really important, like for my work and, um, and everything like that. So I think the other camera I had was kind of holding me back and, and it was making it so I had a lot less photos that turned out because the focus was like really, really bad. And yeah. most of my photos would be out of focus and stuff like that. So, hmm. so it's been really nice to upgrade. I'm glad you've got a new baby. <laughs> I name all. Yeah, my I'm like cameras. looking at it. It's like right beside me in the bag. <laughs> uh, they should be right beside you. Everybody's cameras. I've got my cameras here. I've got my cameras back up in here. It's very important. All right, I got my camera right here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, whatever works, right? Whatever works. And I think Leah can can attest to this. I mean, you don't need to be a super techie camera person to be a great photographer. Um, I remember when I first started working with Peter McKinnon. He came in and uh, he was talking to somebody about a kit camera and how the person was really disrespecting this kit camera. And Pete's like, this is exactly what I use for this photo. And he showed a photo that Adidas hired him to do. And it's not about the tool. Sometimes it's about how you use it. And I, I, you've probably, your first book was probably made with one of your rebels. I would assume. Yeah. Right? I was going to say, it's so, funny you say that. Cause I'm, I'm proof of that. Like, this entire book was, I think, the T2i, there you go. and this entire book was the T5i, and I, I guarantee you this one was T2i, kit lens, automatic mode, like, as bad as it gets. Yeah, but you <laughs> framed it right, you told the story, you brought passion to it, that's what matters, I love yeah. that, love that. And so, some of my best images were, were taken in that, in that way, on that camera, and, like, now they're, like, 30 by 40 prints, like, in different See? countries, and, like, yeah. pe um, like, when people always talk about equipment, I always say, like, with the littlest equipment, I was able to do this. So you don't need you. the best. <laughs> You're inspirational on many levels, many, Absolutely. many levels. Absolutely. All right. Well, Thank you so much. With you today. It's been, it's been very eye opening to say the least. So this has been a lot of fun. Absolutely. I don't know if fun's the right word, but no. <laughs> I hope no. I hope I important. Hope for sure, yeah. I think important, important is the word, at least for me. Yeah. All right, we're done. Thank you so much, Leah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ryan. Um, unfortunately, Aurora wasn't able to be with us tonight. Uh, she wasn't feeling so well. Hope she feels better. And we see her next week. Until then, everybody, thank you so much for being here for us this week. And we will see you all very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.